Hello children, I am Ravi Chandra. I am here to discuss a botany chapter called Biological Classification. And before I start this topic, one or two words which I want to tell to you. Because you are in the last leg of your preparation, time matters a lot. You need to read more number of chapters in a short period of time. All of you know pretty well that the book in which you have to read is NCRT book. You have to read it many, many times. And if that reading process is facilitated by some other means like what we are trying now, it will be very handy for you. So what I need to do today is I should make your textbook reading more easier. I should elaborate those areas which are unaddressed in your textbook. So today we'll try to do that. So I hope that this small attempt of mine will help you to understand things in a better way and give a lot of confidence to this chapter called biological classification. That's the chapter which we're going to discuss today. Now, the point which I want to do here is whenever you read the textbook, imagine it takes X amount of time. Whenever you're listening to me, it should be X minus something. It should not be X plus something then this whole exercise will be futile. So it means that listening to me should help you to complete your textbook more faster. So I should hurry up things. I should discuss things more faster. And writing on the board will take a lot of time. Drawing things about rubbing this board and all that is a time taking process. I'll skip many things writing on the board. What I'm going to do is I'm going to explain this topic, the areas where you're not good at such that it will properly get set into your mind. Anyhow, you're all my students here. So you'll be available, I will be available to you at all times. So what I can do is I can prepare a PPT of what all I'm talking here. And I can give to our people such that they can create those PPTs and give, and give to you after my lecture. Hope that this is fine. And with this, without wasting a single second, we are going to start a chapter called Biological Classification. When we talk about biological classification, first we talk about types of classification. The two important types of classification, if you look, first is non-scientific. The first one is non-scientific classifications. Second one is scientific classifications. Now, what is the meaning of non-scientific? Those classifications which is not based on science. Early man have classified the plants into useful, unuseful, and poisonous. That is non-scientific. There is no science involved here. Then we talk about scientific system of classification. When we talk about scientific system of classification, we talk about the scientist Aristotle's classification, where he classified all plants into herbs, shrubs, and trees based on the nature of stem. That is based on science, so therefore scientific. He also classified animals, those with red blood and those without red blood. Second classification is Linnaeus classification. He classified all living organisms into plants and animals based on the presence and absence of cell wall as a criteria. We'll come back to Linnaeus classification in a second. Third classification is Whittaker's classification. He classified living organisms into five kingdoms. What is the criteria for that? I'll come back in a second. And fourth one is Carl Woe's classification. All right, he also classified living organisms into six kingdoms. So we have completed non-scientific and scientific. Aristotle, Linnaeus, Whittaker, and Carl Woe's. These are the four scientists who propose these classifications as such. Now, the most important out of all is the Linnaeus classification, where he said that those which contain cell wall are plants, those without cell wall are called animals. I have an option of writing on the board, but again, I feel that's a waste of time. So therefore, just listen to me what I'm saying. Which group of organisms are kept on the plants? If you look, archaebacteria, they contain pseudomurine, therefore, he kept them on the plants. Eubacteria, they contain peptidoglycan, therefore, they kept on the plants. Mycoplasmas, no doubt they don't have cell wall, but he was reluctant to keep under animals, so he kept mycoplasmas aside. Then, diatoms, they contain cell wall with silica, so plants. Dinoflagellates, they contain thick cellulosic plates, plants. Euglena, they don't have cell wall, but at the same time, he was reluctant to keep under animals simply because they contain chlorophyll A and B. 
So he did not classify euglena into any group. Slime mouths, he did not classify them into any group. Protozoans, they don't have a cell wall, therefore he kept under animals. Fungi, they contain cell wall, therefore he kept under plants. And alga to angiosperms obviously come under plants. Protozoa to mammalia, they don't have a cell wall, they come under animals. That's about Linnaeus classification. The merits of Linnaeus classification is majority of organisms got accommodation in these kingdoms, you know, in these two kingdoms. The demerits of Linnaeus classification, there are too many. One, prokaryotes are kept along with eukaryotes, isn't it? The bacteria, prokaryote is kept along with plants just because they contain cell wall, demerit. Demerit number two, unicellular organisms are kept along with multicellular organisms. Say for example, diatoms, dinoflagellates, they're kept along with plants. All right, protozoans, they're kept with animals, even though the former is unicellular, not latter. Third important demerit, autotrophs and heterotrophs are kept in the same group. Autotrophs got terribly annoyed when a heterotroph, lazy heterotroph is kept along with it. Fungi, they never produce their own food. They had a place along with plants. They're seated along with plants, which plants did not like. So therefore, these are the three important demerits of uh, Linnaeus classification. The intelligent Whitaker addressed this in a nice way. Look, what are the first demerit of Linnaeus classification? Or, uh, uh, prokaryotes are kept along with eukaryotes. Whitaker conveniently kept prokaryotes aside and created a kingdom called Monera. What are the second demerit? Unicellular organisms are kept along with multicellular organisms. Whitaker conveniently separated protista and created a separate kingdom called Protista, which include unicellular eukaryotes. What the third demerit? Heterotrophic fungi are kept with autotrophic organisms. So therefore, he kept fungi separately in a separate kingdom. And the remaining organisms are placed in plants and animals. So the two common kingdoms in Linnaeus and Whitaker's classification is plants and animals. So there are five kingdoms in Whitaker's classification. Monera, Protista, Fungi, Plantia, and Animalia. Now look here, what are the criteria? Prokaryotes are given a separate kingdom. They differ in cell structure when compared to eukaryotes. So the first criteria is cell structure. Protestants, they are unicellular. They are separated from multicellular. Second, cellular organization. Third, fungi are sub nutrition. And of course, he also took reproduction and phylogeny also as a criteria. So there are five criteria in Whitaker's classification. That's a very important point to note. And Whitaker published in, 18, in 1969, his classification is phylogenetic. Now let us quickly conclude this topic, introduction topic. Right, scientist name, Linnaeus, Whitaker, an organism. Let us put Archibacteria in Linnaeus, plants in Whitaker, Monera. Clear? Eubacteria, Linnaeus, plants, Whitaker, Monera. Cyanobacteria, interesting. Linnaeus, plants, because they contain cell wall. And in Viteca, Monera, because blue-green alga is a prokaryotic. Diatoms, Linnaeus, plants, Viteca, protista. Dinoflagellates, Linnaeus, plants, Viteca, protista. And the point which you have to pinch and remember is the question which is going to come now. Chlorella and Chlamydomonas. Linnaeus, plants, because they have cell wall. Viteca, also, plants, most of you say that, because in plant kingdom you study this. No. Chlorella and Chlamydomonas are unicellular and eukaryotes. So therefore, they are kept under protista. Remember this. Chlorella and Chlamydomonas are kept under protista in Whitaker's classification. Next. Slime mouths, put that aside. Now we go to protozoans. In protozoans, in Linnaeus classification, protozoans don't have a cell wall, animals. Whereas in Whitaker's classification, very important, they are kept under protista. Very important. Chlorella and Chlamydomonas, they are kept under protista in Viteca. Don't forget that. Protozoans, they are kept under protista. Finished. Fungi. In Linnaeus classification, plants. In Viteca's classification, fungi. Alga to angiosperms. In Linnaeus classification, plants. And in Viteca's classification, plants. Porifera to mammalia. In Linnaeus classification, animals, and in Whitaker's classification, animals. That's it. So be clear about uh, some of the important highlights which I said. Don't forget that. And the last. Before I get into each kingdom, all right, first let us talk about, come back to the criteria of Whitaker. Cell structure. 
Monera prokaryotic, remaining four kingdoms eukaryotic. Then cellular organization, Monera and protista unicellular, fungi multicellular with loose tissue, don't forget that. Plants multicellular with organs, root, stem and leaf are organs. Animals multicellular organs and organ systems, mouth, esophagus, stomach, intestine, all of them put together form digestive system. Digestive system is an organ system. So organs are mouth, esophagus. Organ systems is a digestive system. So animals have di organ systems as well. Then coming to nutrition. Monera, both autotrophic and heterotrophic. Within autotrophic, they are photoautotrophic and chemoautotrophic. And heterotrophic as well. Coming to nutritional diversity. That's a very popular question with regard to monera. Coming to protista. Again, they are autotrophic and heterotrophic. Diatoms, dinoflagellates and euglenoids are autotrophic. And slime mouths and protozoans <coughs> are heterotrophic. Coming to fungi, they are heterotrophic. Coming to plants, they are autotrophic. Coming to animals, they are heterotrophic. So the two kingdoms with both autotrophic and heterotrophic are the first two kingdoms. Keep that in mind. Then after that, the most important will be what is called, uh, that's all. Primitive phylogeny, the next is phylogeny, reproduction, all of them shows sexual and asexual, I'm not going to discuss in that. Then coming to phylogeny, Monera is the primitive kingdom and Animalia is the most advanced kingdom. And the point which is very important is about the cell wall, listen carefully, it is clearly given in your textbook. Monera, they contain peptidoglycan which contain two types of amino sugars alternating with each other, NAG and NAM. Protista. They contain cell wall and some of them are devoid of cell wall. Diatoms and dinoflagellates contain cell wall, especially diatoms with silica. Underline that, that question is a probable question on 5th of May. Silica. All right, dinoflagellates also contain thick cellulosic walls. Euglena, slime mouths and protozoans don't have a cell wall. There is a small catch there. Slime mouths contain cell wall in their spores. Don't forget that. The plasmodium of slime mouths, which is a vegetative mass, doesn't have any wall. Coming to fungi, they contain a cell wall with NAG. What is NAG? N-acetyl glucose amine. Break it, glucose. It's a sugar. Amine, amino sugar. So amino sugars are present not only in fungi in their cell wall, but also NAG and NAM is also seen in bacteria. Also seen in bacteria. You remember that. These two are very important points to remember. Plants have contained cell wall with cellulose, pectin along with its suberin, lignin, cutin in different tissues, all of you know that. Animals don't have a cell wall. That completes a small table, your textbook, which I'm pretty sure that you're able to remember it without any problem. Children, now let us start. We are almost, you know, we are trailing again. All right, because I want to see that this class is extremely useful in completing the syllabus more faster. So my criteria is to complete all the important points in a more faster way because reading slow is also wasting time now so when you have fag end of your syllabus even reading slow is not allowed all right you have to read more faster and this class should is main intention of this class is to see that it is completed faster so therefore please allow me to hurry up more faster and complete next kingdom monera we'll put a small time 10 minutes all right for Monera, not even 10 minutes, maybe less than 10 minutes will complete Monera. Now listen carefully. It is a prokaryotic kingdom. Monera, how to read Monera? Listen carefully again. Monera can be read like this. Archaebacteria, eubacteria, correct. Eubacteria is again divided into autotrophs, heterotrophs, yes. Autotrophs are again divided into photoautotrophs, chemoautotrophs, correct. Heterotrophs are again divided into saprophytes, parasites, and symbionts. Finished. Kingdom Monera is over. All right. I come back to the table again. Monera. First, Archaebacteria, Eubacteria. Eubacteria is again divided into autotrophs, heterotrophs. Autotroph is again divided into photoautotrophs, chemoautotrophs, and heterotrophs are divided into parasites, saprophytes, and symbionts. Cello. We go to Archaebacteria first. They are primitive, all of you know that, they contain cell wall distinctly with pseudomurine, a probable question which was asked many times in NEAT. How could Archaebacteria survive hostile environments because of their cell wall, not only cell wall, even it contains branched chain lipids and plasma membrane which also imparts resistance to against hostile environments. 
but your textbook highlights cell wall, so give preference to cell wall. Even branched chain lipids and plasma membrane makes them tolerant to that extreme conditions. Now, few more points about archaebacteria. Listen carefully. Archaebacteria also contain histones. That is interesting because your teacher said that or you heard in your textbook that histones are seen only in eukaryotes. But archaebacteria is a prokaryote which contain histone. Archaebacteria also contain three types of RNA polymerases. What did you study in molecular basis? Three types of RNA polymerases is characteristic of eukaryotes. But this is a prokaryote which contain RNA polymerase 1, 2 and 3 producing different types of RNAs. That is the reason Carl Woese has separated Archaebacteria from remaining bacteria and gave a separate kingdom. That is the reason in Carl Woese classification there are six kingdoms. Archaebacteria, Eubacteria, Protista, Fungi, Plantia and Animalia. Very important point to remember. Of course, Carl Woese also classified all the six kingdoms into three domains. Archaea, all right, is kept uh, what is called Archaebacteria, Eubacteria and also what is called all the eukaryotes are kept under eukarya, eukarya, all right. So all there are how many domains? Three out of which two are prokaryotic domains, Archaebacteria and eubacteria. One is a eukaryotic domain, eukarya and how many kingdoms? Six out of which the first two kingdoms are prokaryotic, the remaining four kingdoms are eukaryotic. That is a very important point. I come back to Archaebacteria again. Archaebacteria divide into methanogens, thermoestrophiles and halophiles. All of you know that methanogens are there in biogas plants, thermoestrophiles, hot springs, etc. And the halophiles are seen in um, what is called saline or uh, alkaline environments. That is an important point to remember. Finished, that is about Archaebacteria. Just remember the points what I said. Then we copy to eubacteria. Eubacteria divide into two types I said, autotrophs and heterotrophs. Autotrophs are again divided into photoautotrophs and chemoautotrophs. Under photoautotrophs, three important examples I want you to remember. One is blue-green alga, second is chlorobium, third is chromatium. Blue-green alga means cyanobacteria, second is chlorobium, green sulfur bacteria. What did you study in photosynthesis? Warren Neal reported that in photosynthesis, normally oxygen is liberated because water gets oxidized. But in green sulfur bacteria called chlorobium, oxygen is not liberated because H2S get oxidized. And purple green sulfur bacteria also, sulfur compounds get oxidized, there is no liberation of oxygen. So green sulfur and purple green sulfur are anoxygenic photosynthesis because oxygen is not liberated because sulfur compounds get oxidized. Then what about blue green alga? In interesting, I want to tell you six points about blue green alga. There's half a dozen points of blue green alga only are important, listen carefully. One, they may be filamentous, colonial or they may stay as a unicellular, filamentous, canolial or unicellular. Two, they are mostly terrestrial, aquatic and also some of them are terrestrial. Three, they form water blooms. Four, the entire filament is surrounded by a mucilaginous sheath. Five, they contain nitrogen fixing cells called heterocysts, very important. They are thick walled, impermeable to oxygen, such that oxygen does not play any inhibitory role. And last important point of cyanobacteria is they are mostly useful in nitrogen fixation. Nostoc and anabina are biofertilizers. Even spirulina, do not forget this, is a blue green alga. Spirulina is an SCP. Go to a pharmacy, ask for a spirulina tablets. They are dark grass green color tablets, capsules. They are going to enrich you with plenty of protein. They are spirulina. Spirulina is an SCP, remember that. Do not get confused about these two examples, children, concentrate here. Spirulina, in Linnaeus classification, where it is kept, it is a cyanobacteria, so therefore plants. In Whittaker's classification, where they are kept, very important. Spirulina is a prokaryote, therefore it is a monera. Do not forget that. Time and again, I see students getting confused between spirulina and spirogyra. Spirogyra is a filamentous green alga. In Linnaeus classification, where is spirogyra kept? Surely it should be plants because it contains cell wall. And in Whittaker's classification, where is spirogyra kept? Surely under plants because it is multicellular, green with cell wall. Chalo, this is very important. If you want to hear, if you get a feeling that I am going little fast, rewind it and listen one more time. So I do not want to repeat this statement again, alright? We will go ahead now. 
these are all the important points about cyanobacteria which is autotrophs. So, we have completed eubacteria auto, photo autotrophs. Now, we go to chemo autotrophs. Now, what are chemo autotrophs? They oxidize the chemicals inorganic chemicals and what did your chemistry teacher said oxidation of inorganic chemicals is always an energy releasing process and that energy they use it all right in order to produce ATP. So, it means that they are producing their own energy by oxidizing inorganic chemicals therefore, they are rightly called chemo autotrophs example iron bacteria, sulfur bacteria, nitrifying bacteria the chemical in which they oxidize based on that they oxidize iron to get energy iron bacteria, they oxidize sulfur compounds to get energy sulfur bacteria, they help in mineral cycling remember that. Coming to heterotrophs, there are three types of heterotrophs, parasites, saprophytes and symbionts. Parasites, come on, xanthomonos citri which cause canker in citrus, you have seen many lime uh, citrus fruits, it has got dark brown colored dots, those are all pustules, small swellings which get burst into and leave a small mark on it that will have less amount of citric acid. It is, it is diseased lime, canker in citrus, canker is like cancer, small swelling on the fruit wall, xanthomonos citri, lactobacillus all of you know curdling of milk if you want to convert milk into curd add a little bit of curd, curd contain plenty of lactobacillus, it is going to convert lactose sugar into lactic acid that is the reason the milk turns sour in taste and not only that it also helps in coagulation of a milk protein called casein that is the reason why the milk is going to get converted into curd, lactobacillus it is also probiotic. When you are very small, when you are suffering with all kind of intestinal infections your mother is going to cut a small packet called sporolac which contain many lactobacillus spores interesting your mother is going to feed you or right, you are fed with a bacteria this is interesting and this is surprising too and what are the bacteria you are fed lactobacillus and when it is added to water and when this lactobacillus is taken by you that used to enter into elementary canal fight against disease causing microbes and going to kill them you are employing one bacteria to kill another this is what is what is called probiotic. So, probiotic in, in microbes chapter you studied lactobacillus is responsible for that. Chalo, that is about heterotrophs. Symbionts of course, all of you know rhizobium, it is a bacterium which stays in the root nodules doing the job of symbiotic nitrogen fixation and there are many bacteria. So, one last question is bacteria friends or foes to man, surely it is both, it is more a friend than a foe if at all there is a debate I, I always take that it is more a friend. Children a bacteria will never enter into your body without the permission unlike a virus virus does not know any discipline, does not follow any discipline here all right no manners it enters into your body without your notice that is the reason you mask yourself. Bacteria never does it, if you want to the bacteria gets into your body only from contaminated water and contaminated food. So, if you properly wash your hands and take a hot food no question of any bacteria. So, therefore, bacteria surely is a friend the earth would have been the largest dustbin if bacteria is not there because the bacteria are major decomposers of organic matter finished. Let me not waste my time here that completes the first kingdom very important kingdom that is Monera. Hope that you are able to remember all the points what I said here. I forgot one point about mycoplasma, mycoplasmas do not have a cell wall. So, therefore, they can change their shape a lot they are called jokers all right because they keep on changing their shape. All right next important point mycoplasmas are aerobic but can survive even in the absence of oxygen. So, are they compulsory anaerobes? No, they are sometimes anaerobes. What is synonym for compulsory? Obligate. What is synonym for sometimes? Facultative. So, they are sometimes aerobes or sometimes anaerobes. They are mostly aerobic, sometimes anaerobes. Therefore, they are rightly called facultative anaerobes. Remember, very important. That is about and they cause diseases, which is brooms is a disease mycoplasma is caused in plants, bronchomycosis is a disease which cause it which cause in animals. So, mycoplasmas are causing disease both in plants and animals and what did you study in cell the unit of life? Mycoplasma is the smallest known cells, they are also called PPLVOs pleuropneumonia like organisms. That completes this topic, I think we have completed in an appropriate time 10 minutes that is about Michael that is about kingdom monera. Now, we go to the next 
what is called kingdom without wasting any time. And this time it is protista. Again, we are going to fix the time, children. All the 10 minutes is the time which we are going to fix for protista. Listen carefully. It is a unicellular eukaryotic kingdom. It is unicellular eukaryotic kingdom that is protista. They are mostly aquatic. Very important point. Mostly aquatic. Don't forget that. All right. Yes. They, they are the connecting links between higher group of organisms. Why I say so? Because diatoms and dinoflagellates resemble plants. Therefore, they are called plant protists. Euglenoids, they resemble both plants and animals, plant animal protists. Then what is called slime mouths, they resemble even fungi, plant animal fungal protists. And protozoans, they resemble animals, therefore they are animal protists. That's a very important point to remember. Next point about protista, listen carefully. All right, protistans can be broadly classified into two. Now we are always what is called keen, keen, keen on dividing these subtopics into small graphs that will help you to remember, just like as we did for Monera. All right, just as we did for introduction to biological classification also. So two, two important. One, plant protists, all right, better way, better way, autotrophic protists and heterotrophic protists. Let me divide like this. Autotrophic protists and heterotrophic protists. What are the three examples of autotrophic protists? Diatoms, dinoflagellates, and euglenoids. What are the two examples of heterotrophic protists? Slime mouths and protozoans. Cello, we'll go with autotrophic protists, and the time we are going to allot for this is five minutes. Now listen carefully. There are five side headings I'm going to take, children. First is habitat. Second, I'm going to talk about the cell wall. Third, I'm going to talk about the flagella. Four, I'm going to talk about the pigments. Five, I'm going to talk about reproduction. Six, if there is any special character concerned with it. Without wasting any time, we'll get into the first three, king, first three units. First, first I said habitat. Now, where do you see red tides? Red tides are not seen in a lake beside your house, surely not. So it is seen only in oceans. Red tide, goniolax. What is goniolax? Dinoflagellate. So easy way to remember. Dinoflagellate is marine. Euglena can be seen in ponds, rivers, lakes, stagnant fresh water. Therefore, euglena is fresh water. So, dinoflagellates, marine, euglena, fresh water. Then, what about diatoms? Both marine and fresh water, but mostly marine. So, habitat, diatoms, mostly marine, but they are more marine and fresh water. Dinoflagellates, marine. Euglenoids, fresh water, finished. Habitat is over. Then we talk about the cell wall. Cellulose with silica is seen in diatoms. When the diatom look, look, which look like a soap box, when they die, they get into the bottom of the water and they mix along with the soil. Because it contains silica, it forms a tough, gritty layer. So that thick cell wall with silica along with the soil will be very gritty. That forms diatomaceous earth, which is used in polishing, painting, etc. Don't forget that. That's about the cell wall of diatoms. Don't forget decimates are called golden alga, which is also come under chrysophytes. Next, coming to dinoflagellates. They contain thick cellulosic plates. Coming to euglenoids. No cell wall. They contain pellicle, which is made up of protein. Finished. Then we talk about flagella. Diatoms do not have any flagella, they glide in water. Whereas dinoflagellates contain two flagella, one is like this, other is 90 degrees, perpendicular. Euglenoids have one long flagella and one short flagella, two unequal flagella. Finished. Then we talk about chlorophyll pigments. Diatoms have A and C, careful, A and C, chlorophyll A and C. Dinoflagellates, A and C. And this question is a very popular question asked. Euglenoids, A and B. What are the character of euglena, which is similar to higher plants? Very important. They have chlorophyll A and B, just like higher plants. Please don't forget that. That's about uh, the pigments. The other pigments, if you talk about, diatoms, nothing special. But dinoflagellates have got plenty of xanthophylls, which impart different coloration. And coming to euglenoids, euglenoids contain astaxanthin. 
uh, which is uh, present in paraflagellar body and stigma, which is going to drive euglena towards light. They are not photosynthetic. They are light sensitive pigments, which will allow the euglena to move towards light, outside chance of that question to come. Then we talk about the next is nutrition. Now, what type of nutrition is seen? Diatoms, hugely autotrophic, and they are the major producers of ocean. Dinoflagellates, purely autotrophic, they are the second major producers of ocean. Euglenoids, autotrophic when there is light, heterotrophic in the absence of light, mixotrophic, that point is important, mixotrophic, that's about the nutrition. Then we talk about reproduction. Diatoms, they undergo transverse binary fission. Dinoflagellates also undergo binary fission. Euglenoids undergo longitudinal binary fission. That's it. Palmella stages also seen euglenoids. When conditions are not favorable, they lose their flagella and attains a, what is called thick wall around it. Coming to sexual reproduction, very important. First time in Whittaker's classification, in which kingdom you see the formation of zygote, don't say fungi, don't say plants. The answer for that is protista. In protista, for the first time, there are gametes formation, fusion of gametes. So there is isogamy and isogamy and oogamy in the members of protista. It is seen in diatoms, it is seen in dinoflagellates, it is also seen in euglenoids. That completes the first three. And is there any special character about each one of them? Okay, I'll tell you one for diatoms. What is that? Diatoms have diatomaceous earth. They can be bilaterally symmetric and radially symmetric. Coming to dinoflagellates, is there any special thing about dinoflagellates, children? Yes, there is one. What is the important point about dinoflagellates which you have to remember? That is, dinoflagellates are with uh, what is called uh, uh, goniolax. They cause red tides. Red tides are caused by goniolax. And you know what is the meaning of red tides? Huge amount of goniolax. You know, they, they go on an evening walk in large numbers. All right. So when they move in huge millions, they clog the gills of the fish because they are huge number and they cause suffocation and cause the death of the fish. Not only that, this goniolax also can secrete some neurotoxins which cause the death of the fish because of that as well. Except shellfishes, all the fishes are victims of this goniolax. So red tides, don't forget that very important goniolax. Noctiluca is a bioluminescent dinoflagellate, that's it. Is there any point about euglenoids which is important? Of course, there is one. Mixotrophic nutrition, I already discussed that. And second, palmella stage, very important. Chlorophyll A and B, just like higher plants, very important. They contain pellicle, which is proteinaceous, important. That's it. That completes the first three groups, children, which I'm pretty sure that we are uh, running out of time. So therefore, we, I can't, I don't have time to repeat again. Now we go to slime mouths. This is one, uh, one small unit in the entire protista where you're not sure, even though their lines are only three to four, but you're not sure how to remember these three to four lines. Now look here, I'm going to explain this, all right, in, in a manner which is useful to it. All right, so I'll, go, I'll explain this uh, in, in the easiest possible way, such that you'll not find any big problem in understanding this. So slime mouths, they're also called myxomycetes, don't forget that. They are saprophytic protestants. They are saprophytic protestants. They are also called myxomycetes. Look here, before I see that the board gets mended. All right, just listen to me carefully here. First one, what we're going to talk about is, uh, what the first one, what I'm going to talk about is, yeah, the area where you're finding some difficulty with regard to slime mouths is those lines are not properly matched. So let me explain this because I require a board here and I also require a little bit of more time than the previous one to explain this. You have seen amoeba many times. So this is the amoeba, yes or no, yes. This is the amoeba of one more strain. So I call this amoeba of plus strain and this is the amoeba of minus strain, absolutely no problem. What happens now? What are the three important steps of sexual reproduction? Plasmogamy, karyogamy, and meiosis. It's clearly there in fungi chapter. So now these two amoeba-like cells, they're going to fuse. So plasmogamy occur, protoplasm fuse, even the nuclei fuse, karyogamy occur simultaneously. So resulting in the formation of a diploid amoeba-like cells. This is a diploid cell, 2N. All right, this is N and this is N, this has become 2N. Now what happens to this diploid cell? This diploid cell is going to increase in its size 
all right, is going to increase in its size. Not only that, this nucleus undergo many free nuclear divisions. This nucleus undergo many free nuclear divisions. This cell undergo many free nuclear divisions and it forms a structure called plasmodium. This is called plasmodium. Remember this. This is going to secrete some slime around it. Is it covered by any wall? Absolutely not. What does plasmodium do? It is going to spread on dead and decayed organic matter. Saprophytic. It feeds on dead. This plasmodium is a vegetative mass. Is it single cell? Of course it is single cell. It is an increased, it is a large zygote. Is it deployed? Yes, it is deployed. Is it multinucleate? Yes, it is multinucleate. That's about the plasmodium, all of you know. This is when the conditions are favorable. What if the conditions are not favorable? If the conditions are not favorable, means when there is no proper food available, what this plasmodium will do? This plasmodium is going to produce what is called, look here, aerial fruiting body. This is called sporangium, aerial fruiting body called sporangium. All this deployed nuclei migrate into the sporangium. Huh? What happens after they migrate into the sporangium? They undergo reduction division. When they undergo reduction division, they produce haploid spores and they are surrounded by cellulosic walls. Interesting. So, plasmogamy and karyogamy occur here. There is reduction division occur here. All the deployed nuclei undergo reduction division and produce four times the haploid nuclei which attains a wall, cellulosic wall, a plant character resulting in the formation of spores. What happens to this sporangium or a fruiting body? It breaks, the spores get liberated and 50% of the spores is going to give rise to what is called this amoeba, all right, after the breaking down of wall and the remaining 50% of spores are going to give rise to this amoeba. So easy to remember. And this amoeba-like cells fuse to form a diploid plasmodium, sporangium, all the diploid nuclei migrate, reduction division, spores, they get liberated. What is the plant character? Presence of cellulosic walls around the spores. What is an animal character? Absence of cell wall around the plasmodium. What is the fungal character? Presence of sporangium. Presence of sporangium, presence of spores. So therefore, it's a wonderful example of plant, animal, fungal protist. So that is the interesting part about protista. The boundaries are not properly fixed. All right, plant, animal, fungal protist. That's about the slime owl. This small short discussion, I hope, will help you. All right, to understand this concept without any problem. Did all of you understood this? Yes. The next important thing, what I'm going to talk about is uh, what is called, the next one we are going to discuss here is about protozoans. I don't want to discuss much about protozoans, children. All right. Uh, first, amoeboid protozoans example is amoeba. They contain silica, not in their cell wall, shells. Marine amoeboid protozoans contain silica in their shells. Remember, not cell wall. Cell wall, diatoms. Shells, if they ask you, you take marine amoeboid protozoans. Coming to flagellated, trypanosoma and uh, Lishmania are the two examples of flagellated. Sleeping sickness is caused by trypanosoma. All right. Lishmania calls Kalaza. Coming to ciliated protozoans, only three points are important. Uh, paramecium is called slipper animalcule because it looks like a slipper. It contains a gullet. It contains cilia. The cilia moves in a synchronous manner, pushing water and food into the gullet. And the question which was asked previously in NEET about paramecium is it is binuclear. Don't forget that. It is binuclear. It has got two nuclei. Cell is one, but the nuclei are two. Then we have got sporozoan. Spore-like stage is seen in the sporozoan. Sporozoan's example is a malarial parasite called plasmodium. Look here, there are two places we get plasmodium. Spelling is same. All right. One is plasmodium genus, malarial parasite. Other is a plasmodium, is a vegetative mass which is deployed, multinucleate in slime mouths. I'm pretty sure that by this time, you're good in this. Complete protester, children. It took a little time because Slime mouths, I have to do some work on the board. So therefore, it took time. Now, the most important. Now, the most, the, in fact, this is the last part of this biological classification. And the most important part of biological classification is kingdom fungi. This is one kingdom in which you feel that biological classification is difficult because of this kingdom. 
if this kingdom is not part of biological classification, I'm pretty sure all of you, without exception, would have felt this chapter very easy. All right. But I can assure you, all right, after this lecture, which you are going to listen to me keenly, all right, even this kingdom fungi looks extremely simple and pleasant. All right, and you'll feel more confident that you can answer all the questions from this unit without wasting a single time. All right, single second. We'll start with kingdom fungi. There are four important classes. Directly, I'm going to start with it. All right, cell wall made up of chitin. They're heterotrophs. Vegetative reproduction is by fragmentation. Sexual reproduction is by budding, fission. All right, uh, all these points are simple points which you can read without any problem. And there are three steps in sexual reproduction, plasmogamy, karyogamy, and meiosis. All these are generalized points which you know pretty well. All right, now without wasting any time, we'll get into phycomycetes. First class, ascomycetes, based on the fruiting bodies, based on the type of spores, there are four classes, phycomycetes, ascomycetes, basidiomycetes, and deuteromycetes. Now I want to talk about this kingdom in a simplest way, I told you. Now I want to complete the two kingdoms, a sorry, two classes, ascomycetes and basidiomycetes first. Then I come back to phycomycetes and... Uh, what is called deuteromycetes. Okay, first let me start with phycomycetes. Why to break the law? Phycomycetes, it's also called algal fungi, common name algal fungi. And there are only five points I want you to remember. Don't, don't burden yourself by reading a lot, children. All right, five points, only five. One, as, uh, phycomycetes is called algal fungi because it shows a lot of similarities with regard to alga. It even has cellulosic walls. Normally in fungi, you say it has got chitinous walls. Some of the members have even cellulosic walls. But don't say it has fungi hunted cellulosic, only this group, some members. Second important point, phycomycetes members are aquatic in nature. Aquatic, very important. Third important point, the entire mycelium, which is said to be the fungal body, is unicellular and multinucleate, very important unicellular and multinucleate. Fourth important point I want you to remember is asexual reproduction is with the help of motile spores called zoo spores. Zoo, animal. What are the animal character? Motility, zoo spores. And asexual reproduction can also with the help of non-motile spores called aplanospores. And the last important point, fifth, sexual reproduction. Plasmogamy and karyogamy occur, resulting in the formation of a diploid zygospore. Textbook says zygospore in place of zygote. Textbook also says oospore, which is other name for zygospore. No confusion. So zygospore and oospore are diploid, unlike asexual spores, which are haploid. Remember that. I repeat again, in sexual reproduction, gametes fuse. Plasmogamy occur, karyogamy occur. You see the formation of a diploid zygospore, also called oospore. This diploid zygospore immediately undergo reduction division and produce haploid spores. These haploid spores will give rise to unicellular multinucleate or sinocytic mycelium. Don't forget that. Unicellular multinucleate sinocytic mycelium. So don't you get a feeling that we are discussing green alga? Because even in green alga, what did you study? Gametes fuse to form zygote. Zygote undergo reduction division and give rise to spores. It means that zygote is the only diploid cell. The remaining everything is haploid. Life cycle is haplonitic. Similar here. Here also the life cycle is haplonitic. Rhizopus grows on bread, bread mold. Albigo, which cause white rust in crucifers. Don't forget that. These are the two important numbers of phycomycetes. Six points I told you. All six are important. Don't forget that. Now we go to the next group called ascomycetes. Let me use a board here to explain this very important unit called ascomycetes. Now listen carefully. We'll complete in two minutes. Just two minutes. Now listen carefully. These, this is uh, what is called... Uh, I'm sorry. Just wait. This is what is called uh, ascospore. Now, I'm going to talk about a spore here. This is one type of spore called ascospore. Ascospore. Huh. Concentrate here. So, this will be the last time in your life to read this. All right, if you concentrate properly here. 
ascospore of male. So male is called plus. This is an ascospore of female. Then I call this as minus half. What happens next? This ascospore germinate means develop into a mycelium, yes, which is multicellular and septate. And the terminal cell transform into antheridium. <coughs> I'm sorry, antheridium. This mycelium is said to be primary mycelium or monokaryotic mycelium. This ascospore is not going to keep quiet. It also produces what is called a mycelium. This is the mycelium which it produces. Yes or no? It also produces a sex organ at the tip, and this is called ascogonium. This is called ascogonium, and this is called antheridium. This is called antheridium. Finished, children. What did you study here? Ascospores developing into primary mycelium. This is the primary mycelium or monokaryotic mycelium of minor strain. This is plus strain, and they produce the sex organs, antheridia and ascogonia. Uh, what happens next? Listen carefully. Plasmogamy occur. In sexual reproduction, there are three stages. First, plasmogamy, karyogamy, and meiosis. Plasmogamy occur, but not karyogamy. Not karyogamy. Interesting. Whereas in phycomycetes, plasmogamy and karyogamy occur among gametes, resulting in the formation of diploid, zygospore, or oospore. But here, only plasmogamy occur, but not karyogamy. Then what happens? This nucleus is going to migrate here because the nuclei don't fuse. Ha. Huh. What next? Then this become dikaryotic. Yes. From this ascogonium, from this ascogonium, this dikaryotic cell divide and give rise to a mycelium. And give rise to a mycelium. Hence, these hyphae are called ascogenous hyphae. Obviously, this is binucleate. Every cell surely will have two nuclei. Every cell surely will have two nuclei. This is called dikaryotic mycelium this i'm going to call it as dikaryotic i think i've drawn too many branches taking more time to fill this is called dikaryotic mycelium dikaryotic mycelium this is monokaryotic dikaryotic how is it cup shaped this is the cup shaped mycelium what you're going to see here this cup shaped mycelium is actually edible it in the sense that you can eat morals and truffles are the costly mushrooms which you are going to eat, morals and truffle. This is the one what you are going to eat in mushroom. I hope that all of you eat mushrooms. Do you? Because mushrooms are rich in proteins, which is good for your immunity. Mushrooms have less amount of carbohydrates, less amount of fats, so which is going to keep you healthy. So keep eating mushrooms and those who, are, those who eat and don't, those who don't eat, start eating them. All right, this is a mushroom, costly mushroom, morals and truffles. This is a cup-shaped mushroom. What happens next? What happens next? This is a secondary mycelium, isn't it? Then also, what's the name given to this? This is called ascocarp. Why I call ascocarp? Because it's a fruiting body or a mushroom. What next is some of the cells at the tip, some of the cells at the tip transform into a sac-like structure. Same diagram I'm taking here. Sac-like. Is it dikaryotic? Yes. This is called ascus. Ascus. What happens now? The two nuclei fuse. This is karyogamy. Now the two nuclei fuse. Where is plasmogamy occurring? Here. Where is karyogamy occurring? Here. Do you see a long time gap between plasmogamy and karyogamy? Yes. That is the reason why it is dikaryotic. Good question. Assertion reason. A dikaryotic mycelium is seen in the life cycle of ascomycetes. Reason. Long time gap exists between plasmogamy and karyogamy. That's it. Imagine if karyogamy also occurred here. Then why do you see two nuclei? You don't see that. That's a very simple point. After karyogamy, what did you study? Plasmogamy, karyogamy was the third step, meiosis. This undergo reduction division and produce four spores. I'm sorry. All the four spores are produced inside. All right. These four spores which are produced inside are called ascospores. They get liberated. Ascospores get liberated. 
two of them are plus and two of them are minus and you know what the spore do again they produce primary mycelium primary mycelium of plus strain antheridium primary of mycelium of minus strain ascogonium plasmogamy occur but not karyogamy you see a dikaryotic mycelium then they produce a terminal ascus that ascus karyogamy and reduction division occur this looks very simple but I don't want to talk about the examples there which I'm pretty sure that all of you remember neurospora experimental pet, experimental fungi used mostly in experiments Fun, uh, and um, puccinia that is also one of the important example all right then you have got claviceps it cause ergot disease in rice rye plant ergot then you have got um, yeast saccharomyces it is unicellular it reproduced by budding used in baking and brewing industry because it secretes an enzyme zymase all right then you have got morels and truffles which are most costly mushrooms so these are all the prominent examples all right aspergillus which cause aspergilliosis a disease and also produce citric acid which you studied in microbes chapter even monascus bioactive molecule produced monascus also belong to ascomycetes likewise i can talk about many examples that's about ascomycetes children which i'm pretty sure that you understood this then we go with basidiomycetes once you understand ascomycetes basidiomycetes also becomes simple it's more easier than this now same in place of ascospore i say basidiospore that's it again primary mycelium yes primary mycelium yes is it monokaryotic yes is it the same thing you discussed in ascomycetes huh are you revising again ascomycetes no is it basidiomycetes yes then there i talked about ascogonium antheridium and ascogonium here i'm not drawing those sex organs directly this vegetate to hyphae fused it's more easier the nuclei of this and this come together so plasmogamy occur but not karyogamy the two nuclei remain separate followed by division resulting in the formation of a dikaryotic mycelium same way what we have seen in ascomycetes but i want to tell you a small difference this dikaryotic mycelium which is forming a cup shaped itself forms a mushroom there but in comes to basidiomycetes this dikaryotic mycelium <coughs> is going to produce aerial fruiting bodies these are the mushrooms these are the aerial fruiting bodies you call them as mushrooms what does the aerial fruiting body contain it contains a stipe and a cap look an umbrella you have seen umbrella isn't it it has got a stalk and a cap and what do you see on the lower side of an umbrella don't you see the iron spikes iron spokes correction same way on the lower side you see many structures similar to that these are called gills if you take a section of a gill if you take a section of a gill you see a dikaryotic cell this is called basidium are come on children everything is dikaryotic so one of the dikaryotic cell in the gill is basidium now just like ascomycetes karyogamy occur just like ascomycetes reduction division occur the only difference is these sexual spores are produced externally shall i tell you the easy way to remember mushrooms are seen externally fruiting bodies even the sexual spores are seen externally in basidiomycetes easy way to remember i told you the best way to remember these two are plus and two are minus well you know what this is this and this is this again they produce primary mycelium plasmogamy occur not karyogamy resulting in dikaryotic mycelium they produce aerial fruiting bodies called as called basidiocarp stalk cap gills section of a gill contain a club like structure club like that's the reason it's called club mass ascomycetes sac, sac sorry did i say moss no club fungi whereas in ascomycetes it is called sac fungi the two nuclei fuse karyogamy reduction division easy way to remember don't you see a lot of similarities in ascomycetes and basidiomycetes yes in both of them there are sexual spores there are ascospores here basidiospores both of them produce monokaryotic primary mycelium both of them primary mycelia of plus and minus strain male and female fuse 
to form a dicaryotic mycelium. The only difference is in ascomycetes, you see sex organs you don't see here. In both of them, this dicaryotic mycelium forms the fruiting body. There it is called ascocarp, here it is called basidiocarp. In both of them, there are a dicaryotic cell called ascus there and basidium here. Ascus is sac-like, basidium is club-shaped. In both of them, karyogamy occur in ascus and basidium. In both of them, reduction division occur in ascus and basidium. In both of them, sexual spores are produced. The only difference is in ascomycetes, they are produced inside the ascus, in basidiomycetes, outside the ascus. That's it. And the mushrooms which are widely available, which you eat is white button mushrooms, agaricus. You also have puccinia. You also have eustilago. Eustilago causes smut disease. Puccinia causes rust, rusty symptoms on plant parts. Smut is a sooty charcoal like powder appearance on plant parts. These are the three important prominent examples. Apart from that, you also have puffball, lycoperidon. You also have a bracket fungi, polyporous. These are all the examples of basidiomycetes. Nothing is there for talk about deuteromycetes, five points. They're called fungi imperfecti because sexual stages are absent. This is sexual reproduction, it's absent. They show only asexual reproduction with the help of conidiospores. I forgot to tell you, in ascomycetes, asexual reproduction is by conidiospores. In deuteromycetes, also it's by conidiospores. Next important point, sexual reproduction is totally absent. The, the, the pycelium is uh, multicellular, branched. Then uh, if any sexual stage is there, it is shifted to ascomycetes. What does it mean? When you read these lines two or three times, you don't understand what does it mean. I'll tell you. When a deuteromycetes member is going to reproducing by conidiospores, it is kept under deuteromycetes. Look here, how the conidiospore is produced, listen carefully. This is the conidiospore. It produces a mycelium. Huh. And at the tip of it, again, conidiospore. As long as it is done, as long as it is going to show this, it is kept under deuteromycetes. Look sometimes what this conidiospore do. It produces a mycelium. At the tip of it, it does not produce conidiospore. It produces antheridium. And one more, produce ascagonium. And these two fuse, dicaryotic mycelium. Somewhere you heard about this, ascomycetes. So if this is going to show a life cycle similar to ascomycetes, sexual stage, then it is no more kept under uteromycetes. It is shifted to ascomycetes with a separate name. Shall I give an example? I will give an example. Fusarium monoliformis. As long as it is showing a sexual reproduction, it is kept under uteromycetes. Suddenly one day, fusarium starts producing not conidiospore, but uh, ascus, oh, sorry, sorry, antheridium, ascagonium, and shata showing sexual reproduction. Then what we did, we did not keep fusarium and deuteromycetes. We shifted to ascomycetes with a separate name called gibberella fusicori. Somewhere you heard about this? Yes, children. Back in the disease in rice is caused by gibberella fusicori, which is an ascomycetes member. Long, long back, when it was showing only asexual reproduction, it has a separate name called fusarium. Once it shows sexual stage, separate name is given. Gibberella fusicori. Clear? I think it's very clear. Uh, one more example is trichoderma. That's an important point. Kingdom plantia, kingdom animalia is not a part of our syllabus. We'll keep that aside. Then one demerit of Whittaker's classification is there are some organisms which are not kept in any of these five kingdoms. Let us talk about that in last two minutes of this class. All right. Organisms which are not kept in any kingdoms. Acellular organisms, cellular organisms. Acellular organisms which are not kept in any kingdom, viruses, prions, virioids. Cellular organisms which are not kept in any kingdom, lichens. Viruses, I want to talk about viruses in two minutes. All right, now what are the points about viruses? They are ultramicroscopic obligate parasites. Look here, why we had to shut down for two years. All right, from 2020 to 2022, it's because of a virus which is very tiny. All right, and uh, which is an obligate parasite on you. Why it is after your life, if some of you got it out. If this is a virus, it has a protein coat called capsid and contain a nucleic acid. This has a riffle inside, imagine it's a pen. All right, that riffle is a nucleic acid and the protecting the riffle is a protein coat called capsid. Cello. 
Is it a cell? Absolutely not. No cell wall, no plasma membrane, no cytoplasm. Doesn't have a cell. Then the virus wants to multiply. Virus says that I can't multiply because I don't have any cell. I don't have a machinery for multiplication. How can I produce a protein coat? And how can I multiply my nucleic acid? Then virus found a strange way. It started entering into your body. Okay, along with your nose, if it's a coronavirus, that's the reason you tied very tightly your nose. It enters into your body. If this virus enter into my lungs, what this virus do? It enter into my alveoli. What this virus do? It has got RNA and a capsid around. That RNA gets multiplied into many RNAs with the help of my enzymes. My ribosomes are made to work for a virus to produce a protein coat. So it dictates my cell if it enters into my body. This virus is going to take control of my cell. It orders my ribosomes. Come on, produce proteins for me. Come on, produce nucleic acid for me. In this way, my cell has no other alternative except to work for this virus which has come from outside. Within no time, this virus multiplies into many. And it has a very cruel way of saying thank you. It bursts your cell and comes out in large numbers just to attack many other cells. That is the dangerous part of a virus. Obligate parasite. Parasite means, you may ask me, is it for water or food? Not at all. The virus is not attacking you for cheap water and food. The virus is attacking you for its multiplication, for its growth. So therefore, that allows me to say, does viruses have both living and non-living characters? Yes. What are the living characters? It contains protein coat. It contains nucleic acid. That nucleic acid can undergo mutations. Those are all the living characters. What are the non-living characters? They don't have any cell. They don't have any metabolism. All right, these are the two non-living characters of a virus. So they don't have any metabolism. So if I take an antibiotic to cure a virus, no utility. Why? Because the antibiotic doesn't know. It goes into your body and comes back and say, I did not see any living creature in, the, in your body except your own cells. All right, so what should, on whom I should act? Correct. So that is the reason viruses become very dangerous. They don't have any metabolism of its own. All right, that is the reason if you're suffering with cold, if you go to a doctor, cold is caused by a virus. If you go to a doctor, it takes seven days. If you don't go to a doctor, it takes one week. You may ask me what you're talking, both are one and the same. Absolutely not. Absolutely correct. It's both one and the same. It means that going to a doctor, not going to a doctor, doesn't make any big difference as far as viral disease is concerned. All right, so it means that virus cannot be cured by any antibiotic because they don't have any metabolism of their own. Then what should I do? All right. Increase your immunity. That's the only way. Let your immune system fight back the virus more strongly. That is the only way to counter virus children. And your immune system works very, very better when you have a proper food, nutritious food, when you have a proper sleep, and when you have a sound and pleasant mind. That is going to impart a lot of immune system, a lot of immunity to you. And just concentrate on that. All right. Uh, sleep, of course, you'll be sleeping less for the coming one year, sorry, coming uh, one month, but after that you sleep a lot. All right, so therefore that is going to increase your immune system. So that's about viruses. The last important point, few scientist names. Ivanovsky, he called viruses as filterable agents because viruses are smaller than bacteria and were able to pass through bacterial filters. Bajunic, after B comes C, he said, Contagium vivum fluidum. After B comes C, he coined the term virus. So C for contagium vivum fluidum. C for coined the term virus. Scientist is Bajunic. What he did? He took a diseased leaf of tobacco. This is a healthy leaf. He rubbed the diseased leaf with healthy. You know what happens? The sap of diseased infected the healthy. And the healthy leaf also suffered with tobacco mosaic virus. Contagium vivum fluidum. Don't forget, coined the term virus. Different books have given differently, but ultimately you have to remember this. Bijunic, contagium vivum fluidum, or coin the term virus. Ivanovsky, filterable agents. Now, what are the important points about uh, the virus? 
virus contain a protein code called capsid which protect the nucleic acid. There are two types of viruses which were elucidated very, very elaborately. One is tobacco mosaic virus and the other is bacteriophage. Last minute, we are going to complete tobacco mosaic virus is rod shaped, bacteriophage is tadpole shaped. Tobacco mosaic virus contain RNA, bacteriophage contain double stranded DNA. Tobacco mosaic virus contain capsomias in a helical manner whereas bacteriophage contain capsomias in 20 equilateral triangles in the head and in helical manner in the tail. So, two types of symmetries, cubic symmetry in the head, helical symmetry in the tail, two types, binal symmetry. Those are the points you have to remember with TMV and bacteriophage. Don't forget TMV is single stranded RNA to bacteriophage double stranded DNA. Tadpole shaped is bacteriophage. Last point, prions and virioids, all of you know children, prions, protein coat alone is present. They are not viruses, they have only protein coat and virioids contain only RNA. And uh, uh, BSC, bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease is a disease caused in cattle by prions. And if that is consumed by humans, in humans they say the disease is caused Kruzfeld Jacob disease, remember this. Highly folded protein is infectious. And coming to virioids, they have Diner reported that their small molecular weight RNAs which is capable of causing disease, spindle tuber disease, potato spindle tuber, citrus exocortosis, other diseases. Lichens, last point, they are the cellular organisms which did not find any place. Then you may ask me, if they are cellular, what, what, why did lichen, why did Viteka did not keep it? Because they have got algal and fungal partners together. Viteka got confused whether they should keep on the plants or fungi. The algal component do the job of photosynthesis and the fungal component do all the other jobs absorbing water, absorbing minerals, asexual reproduction, all the jobs, all right. And lichens are the pioneer community for an ecological succession operating on rocks. And if there is plenty of sulfuric acid, lichens don't grow. So if lichens are not growing around your house, it means that there is plenty of pollution. So lichens do not grow in polluted areas. That's the end of this chapter called biological classification. I hope that you understood this topic properly and it is very simple for you to read again. So listen as many times as possible, if at all you are weak in this and keep reading children. Thank you.